All right, can you see that? Perfect, yeah. We'll hear from Amy about the importance of stratosphere in S2S predictions. Thanks, Amy. Great, thank you, Anish. And thank you, Judith, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this workshop. And today I'm gonna to be talking about how the stratosphere could be used to predict the weather weeks in advance. Um, I'm gonna be focused on the stratospheric polar vortex today, a picture of which is shown in the bottom left here and how it impacts uh, weather at the surface and how this influences S2S prediction. Um, so I know most of you are well aware of what the stratosphere is, but um, because we've been focused so much over the past week on the troposphere and ocean processes, I wanted to briefly remind us where the stratosphere is. Um, it's a layer from 20, 20 to 50 kilometers above the surface. And this is well above where our weather happens. And when the stratosphere, um, early interest in the stratosphere was really not related at all to how it influences weather at the surface. Um, instead, the primary focus was really on the ozone layer, which uh, has its home in the stratosphere and provides protection for us from dangerous UV radiation and allows for life on earth to exist. Um, and I wanted to bring this up because I'm really gonna be focused primarily on dynamics in this talk, not really on chemistry at all, but it's important to remember that ozone interacts with the um, dynamics and a lot of the S2S prediction models, for example, um, don't really incorporate a lot of those feedbacks into them. So that's one thing to think about when I'm talking about this today. So what are the stratosphere troposphere coupling processes that we think might be relevant to S2S prediction? Uh, this little schematic shows sort of the general circulation and the features that we think are relevant. And these are little plots that show height versus latitude for the Southern Hemisphere winter on the left and the Northern Hemisphere winter on the right. And so here the sort of red blobs are the zonal westerly jets. And so you can see in the troposphere, there's the year round tropospheric jets, but in the stratosphere, we only have a westerly jet during the winter in the winter hemisphere. And in the summer hemisphere, there are easterlies in the stratosphere. And this has important implications for how the stratosphere and the troposphere communicate. And um, so I'm gonna be focused primarily on those jets, which are called the polar vortex. And uh, I did wanna point out that there's a lot of other processes that we think are relevant um, on S2S timescales. I think Yaga will next talk about the QBO quite a bit, so you can learn more about how that might influence S2S predictability. Um, then there's things like tropical convection, which can influence planetary waves. So ENSO and MJO can generate these large scale planetary waves that also have a pathway through the stratosphere. And that could potentially extend predictability um, in remote locations. Uh, obviously ozone could be potentially important as I mentioned before, uh, particularly in the Southern hemisphere spring and things like solar variability, surface boundary forcings like sea ice, sea surface temperature and Eurasian snow cover, anything that can uh, essentially modulate either the mean flow or the planetary waves themselves could potentially drive changes um, that are predictable in stratosphere troposphere coupling relationships. Okay, so what is the stratospheric polar vortex? This is a nice image of it from um, February 16th 2020. Um, this is from earth.nullschool.net. And this is kind of an unusual state of the Northern Hemisphere stratospheric polar vortex. This is when it was really strong. And you can see that it's very symmetric um, and annular. And a lot of times the Northern Hemisphere vortex is much more wavy, um, but this was kind of a really unusual event that I'll talk a little bit further about later on. Um, but the the polar vortex describes the westerly circumpolar winds in the winter hemisphere, and these winds are due to seasonal changes in incoming amounts of sunlight. So as the um, in the fall, as the sunlight leaves the polar cap, you start to lose radiative heating by, by the ozone layer in the stratosphere. And so you increase the temperature gradient uh, from the pole to towards the equator, and that drives by thermal wind balance these westerly uh, winds in, in both hemispheres this happens. So this is how we, a typical metric of the stratospheric polar vortex, which is the zonal mean zonal winds at 60 degrees and 10 hectopascals. And this is showing basically the daily climatology 
in the JRA 55 uh, reanalysis record from 1958 to 2018. And so you can see the black line shows the um, daily mean average. And so uh, around January 1st is when the winds on average peak in the Northern Hemisphere stratosphere. And you can see there's a large amount of variability as shown by the gray shading, which shows the maximum and minimum values in the historical record. Um, and these are what we're particularly interested in because when we get extremes in the stratospheric polar vortex, we also that's also when we see the strongest impacts of the surface. And so there's both very strong extremes when the, when the vortex intensifies and becomes much stronger than normal as is shown in this 2020 image. And there's also times when the normally westerly vortex uh, reverses direction completely. And so the winds become easterly in winter. And these are um, well-known events called sudden stratospheric warmings. And so I'll be talking a bit about those too. So um, the important thing when we're talking about stratosphere troposphere coupling is that it's a two-way interaction. It's not just a one-way direction. Um, and so I, I wanted to cover both the upward coupling and the downward coupling and how those things happen. Um, and so when we're talking about upward coupling from the troposphere to the stratosphere, a lot of times what we're talking about is how this troposphere generates waves and how those waves can sometimes go into the stratosphere and change the flow there. And so we think that weather systems, for example, blocking patterns, and also things like land-sea contrasts uh, are associated with these planetary scale atmospheric waves. And we're talking wave numbers one and two, so really the largest scale waves. And if these are in the right location in, in a way that they constructively interfere with the background waves, um, they can actually amplify into the stratosphere as long as the background flow is westerly. Um, so there's no way that the waves can travel into the stratosphere, uh, the polar stratosphere in the summer. So this means that we're really talking about um, between fall and spring when the stratosphere can receive these signals from the troposphere. Um, there's well-known patterns that are associated with the kind of waves that affect the polar vortex. And so this plot by uh, Garfinkel et al. 2010 on the bottom left uh, gives an indication of what the 500 millibar heights look like uh, that precede polar vortex weakening events. And so, for example, when you see a uh, strong wave number one type uh, weakenings in the stratosphere, you also have sort of a wave number one type pattern in the troposphere that's driving that. And this is associated typically with blocking in regions that we normally um, see blocking patterns uh, occur, such as over the Aleutian region in the Pacific and over Scandinavia um, for these wave two events. Sorry about that. So the vertically propagating waves, which is a positive eddy heat flux or V prime T prime can dissipate or break in the stratosphere. And when this happens, it deposits easterly momentum and it slows the westerly polar vortex down sometimes very rapidly. So the momentum deposition from planetary scale waves is thought to be one of the key mechanisms for driving these disruptions, but it's not the only one. Um, in particular, it's been found that you really need the stratosphere itself to be in the right state in order to break down um, because you get some internal resonance of the wave once it's in the stratosphere, if the stratosphere is in the right um, configuration. And so these two processes together are able to um, explain a lot of the reasons why we think these uh, vortex breakdowns occur. And there's usually two ways that these manifest. So I've shown a picture of this here. On the left, we have an inactive polar vortex. So it's a much more symmetric vortex. The uh, black lines here show the potential vorticity contours that kind of give you the shape of the vortex. And when the vortex breaks down in a sudden stratospheric warming event, um, the vortex typically either displaces, in which case the vortex is basically pushed off the pole um, over the extratropics. And you can see the shading here shows the temperature anomaly. So you get a warming that occurs with that. Or the vortex um, can split into two pieces. And these are particularly dramatic events. And usually part of the vortex will go over North America and Canada. Uh, and the other part will go over Eurasia. 
And when the zonal mean zonal wind uh, doesn't just decelerate, but actually reverses direction, we call that a major event. And um, if you want to look at a review of this, there was a recent review by Mark Baldwin et al. in 2021. This just this past year was published. So, all right. So hopefully you can see this little animation. And this is just kind of showing you what is happening in the stratosphere when one of these events happens. Um, the time series at the bottom is you can follow along with how strong the wind was as this event proceeded. This was in 2009. Um, so you can see around January 24th is when the wind actually reverses direction. And the arrows in this plot are showing you the wind direction. So it starts off very westerly. Those are the black arrows. And then by the end here, it actually reverses direction entirely, which is um, a pretty fascinating thing to see because it's uh, you can see how widespread it is. It's a really a hemispheric phenomenon. And um, you can see that it's really altering the entire circulation in the stratosphere, um, in the Northern hemisphere. The black contour here is showing again, the potential vorticity contour. And so in this case, we had, a, a, it sort of elongates first and then it splits into two pieces. And then the, temp the temperatures are shown in the shading. So you can see you get this um, rapid warming of the stratosphere. All right, so these events are very interesting to watch um, from a fluid dynamics perspective, um, but that's not the reason we're really interested in them. Um, we want to understand them because they have a downward influence. And this is shown in this plot using the Northern Annular Mode Index. And uh, this shows a composite of all the historical sudden warmings um, averaged around the date that they occur. And so we can see that day zero is when the zonal mean zonal wind reversed and the NAM responds almost immediately. You see this strong um, negative NAM pattern, which is the red colors here. And from about one millibar to a hundred millibars, um, there's almost an immediate uh, reaction to that um, disruption of the vortex. But then the interesting part is that you can see around 100 millibars, there's this extension of the anomalies that goes out um, well into 60 days after the event. And this is because there's longer radiative time scales in the lower stratosphere, and that leads to the persistence of the anomalies. The vortex can't recover there. Um, and so it, these anomalies just persist for a long time. And that has important implications for um, using this for S2S prediction. Um, and so you can kind of see that there's downward coupling to the surface and it's inter, it's not, it doesn't look as um, continuous as it does in the stratosphere. There's sort of these drips down. And that's because of course, there's a lot of other things going on in the troposphere. So um, we don't always see continuous coupling because there's other factors going on like ENSO, MJO, that's influencing that coupling down to the surface. One of the interesting features we're trying to understand actually is that you might notice that around 500 millibars, there's um, probably a minimum in the coupling and then it amplifies again at the surface. And this is a very common feature following these events. And we're trying to understand what exactly causes um, that surface amplification of the signal. So there's not a consensus on the exact mechanism for how the stratosphere influences surface weather. And I'm not gonna go into detail on these theories, um, but I think it's interesting to note that we, you know, there's been a lot of idealized studies on this, a lot of theoretical studies, and we still don't have a, a really complete answer for how it happens. Um, it's thought that downward control contributes most of the stratospheric response down to the tropopause, and downward control is just where the uh, momentum convergence from the planetary waves um, slows the winds, and then the next group of waves that comes up has to break at a lower height because they can't travel quite as far up the, because the, flows, the flow is slower. But um, then once we get down to the tropopause, it's not really clear how that interacts with um, the tropospheric flow. Um, and what is clear is that it seems like you need some, there's some role of eddy feedbacks that contributes to the response um, that's needed. And I've listed some, some papers here that you could refer to on that. And then there's some ideas of the remote effects of stratospheric potential vorticity anomalies, um, which is sort of a newer idea and might explain some of the surface amplification that we see. So I wanted to share this little video real fast. Um, let me play it. 
This is from NASA GMAO, and the shading here is showing the potential vorticity. And I like this video for two reasons. The first is that um, you can see it, the polar vortex in a very um, clear way that really describes what it actually is doing. So you can see how fluid it is. It looks, um, you can really see the wave breaking that's occurring and the, the filaments that are peeling off. Uh, so it's just a really nice way to picture that. But the other cool thing about this video is that the red contours here show the 200 hectopascal heights at two different levels. And I think you can kind of see, particularly um, over North America, that as this as the vortex starts to split, there's some nudging of the troposphere below it, the jet stream below it. Um, and so this hints at sort of how the stratosphere can potentially interact with the tropospheric flow. And so what this does to surface weather um, is shown on this top left plot. This is a composite of um, the mean sea level pressure anomaly, the surface temperature anomaly, and the precipitation anomaly, day zero to 60 after historical sun warmings. And so you can see that there's a really nice um, negative NAO type pattern in this mean sea level pressure. And this is associated with very cold air outbreaks over most of the extra tropics and also uh, anomalous warmth over Greenland and subtropical Asia and Africa. And additionally, there's precipitation anomalies, particularly over the North Atlantic and European region. And so you have this thing where you have a, a weaker vortex, you actually get these really cold mid-latitude extremes and snowier weather and some anomalous warmth over Greenland and Asia. Um, on the other hand, and this is shown by the schematic in the bottom right, when you have a really stable or strong polar vortex, all that cold air over the Arctic is contained. Um, and so you end up with a warmer winter weather over the Eastern USA, Europe, and Asia, and drier over Southern Europe. And so these changes are persistent and thus potentially predictable. So here's some examples. Um, this was a, a sudden warming event in 2018 that's very well known. Um, in fact, it had such big impacts in Europe that they named the storm Beast from the East. Um, but there was a number of storms, not just that one, that occurred following this sudden warming. There were also about four nor'easters that March that came across um, the North Atlantic due to the strong blocking pattern that was over Greenland at the time associated with the negative NAO following this. Um, so the Northern hemisphere isn't the only one influenced by the polar vortex. The Southern hemisphere has a polar vortex and it can also have impacts. Um, I should note that major midwinter SSWs are rare in the Southern hemisphere. There's just not as much planetary scale wave forcing. Um, and so the vortex is much stronger. It's a lot harder to get a reversal of the vortex. Um, instead, there's a lot of variability linked to surface coupling, um, which occurs in austral spring. But um, this was one example in 2019 where there really was some significant impacts. And Umpa Lim has studied this, and she has a paper in uh, Nature Geoscience showing that um, when you have even an anomalous weakening of the polar vortex, you get increased chances of exceeding um, extreme maximum values of temperature, rainfall, and wildfire danger over Eastern Australia following these events. And a prime example of this occurred in 2019 when we actually had a, a near major warming. It didn't quite reverse, but it was an extreme deceleration of the vortex. And they, it was followed by the most negative Southern annular mode on record. And uh, obviously that that summer in the Southern Hemisphere was followed by some of the worst wildfires they've seen um, and obviously had big impacts. And we had kind of picked apart uh, this relationship in the 2021 BAMS paper that just came out on this event and showed that the vortex uh, breakdown contributed about as much as the record strong Indian Ocean dipole event. So it can be a major player in these extreme so Daniela Domais and I highlighted this in a recent paper to Nature Communications on how stratosphere, how the stratosphere drives extreme events at the Earth's surface. And basically one of our points is that um, 
you know, we when we typically hear about uh, the polar vortex, we all think cold, snowy weather, but really a sudden warming can lead to impacts in a variety of different ways, um, including things like heat over uh, Africa and Asia, um, flooding events, storm series over um, the Northern Atlantic, and in the Southern hemisphere can also have impacts like wet spells over South America, drought and wildfires. And these things can further have impacts on health and transportation, energy and agriculture. Um, so I wanna point out that it's not just a breakdown of the polar vortex, but also a very strong polar vortex can drive surface extremes. And I hinted at this at the beginning of the talk, but in 2020, we saw this really strong polar vortex um, which is shown here in this plot by Zach Lawrence, um, which shows the 10 millibar zonal mean zonal winds as a function of latitude. And you can see it's very um, exceptionally strong. And the bottom plot shows this as a function of pressure and time. And you can see as far back as December 2019 at one millibar, there was some acceleration of the winds. And this really continued for an extremely long period of time. Um, it was very persistent. And of course, um, associated with that was the uh, strongest uh, Arctic oscillation or northern annular mode in the 70 year record, um, which explained about two thirds of the warmth that was then observed in many uh, over Russia and Asia. It was the record hottest winter in many locations, um, I'm sure in part due to climate change, but a large part of that was just this climate variability and this strong coupling between the stratosphere and the troposphere. So now I want to talk briefly about um, what we're doing to analyze the relation, these relationships in the S2S models. And so we have a group called the Stratospheric Network for the Assessment of Predictability, or SNAP. And this is both a WCRP SPARC international activity, and also it's um, a part of, it's a sub-project of the S2S prediction project. And so I'm one of the activity leaders with Haim Garfinkel, and this shows the committee and we're always welcome to have new, especially early career people come help um, analyze the S2S models and the stratosphere. So if you wanna join us, please let me know. Um, but our goal is to assess the stratospheric predictability and its tropospheric impact. And so we recently did uh, a few studies on this. And one of the things we noted is that, well, uh, most of the S2S prediction systems now do have high model lids and are more vertically resolved above 100 hectopascals. And so this plot on the left shows um, which of the S2S models um, have various levels um, in the stratosphere and their model lid height. And so we decided any model that had a lid above 0.1 would be considered a high top model. And most of those also have more levels in the stratosphere. And then we have low top models that don't have as high of lid uh, or very many models in the stratosphere. And then we analyzed some features um, in the S2S models on, in terms of both stratospheric predictability and its role on the troposphere. And so this plot is, a, you don't have to understand the details of this, but the main point is that the stratosphere has longer memory than the troposphere. And this is particularly indicated by the numbers at the bottom here. And so this is showing the anomaly correlation at 50 millibars and at 500 millibars from 20 to 90 north um, in the Northern hemisphere, but similar results are seen in the Southern hemisphere. And so here we were evaluating at what point does the skill fall below 0.6? And so at 50 millibars, it's about double that at 500 millibars. Um, and this is true surprisingly, even in the summertime, um, it's only a difference of about three days in that case, but um, compared to eight days in the winter time. And then we correlated this with, uh, so the, we correlated the prediction scope at 50 with the correlation scale at 500. And we found that models with longer prediction skill in the stratosphere have longer prediction skill in the troposphere. And um, if you consider only the models with a high top um, or a better resolved stratosphere, those also tended to have both the highest correlation in the troposphere and in the stratosphere. So of course the direction of causality here can't be inferred um, because if you have a good, a model with a good troposphere, it most likely also has, um, going, it's just going to have a better stratosphere. It's not necessarily saying the stratosphere is driving a better troposphere. Uh, so we wanted to further understand, can we look at 
forecast of opportunity when there's um, an actual event going on in the stratosphere and see if that changes predictability in the troposphere. So uh, before I get to those results, I wanted to point out that um, we also considered the predictability of the vortex itself and these extreme events in the stratosphere. And so we looked at strong vortex events and sudden warming events. And so this shows the percent of ensemble members capturing uh, observed events during the S2S record um, as a function of lead time. And so you can see obviously that more and more members capture it as you get closer to the event but you can see that you only get accurate detection or more than about 75% of ensemble members at 10 days or less um, on average. So some events you get a little longer lead time, but um, in general, these are not highly predictable. And that kind of makes sense because they're driven by things like weather patterns um, in the troposphere, which themselves are only um, predictable at 10 days or less. So um, unfortunately, we, it's really hard to see a lot of these polar vortex extremes far in advance. Um, it is true that models with a higher model top detect events at longer lead time. So there is some gain uh, to improving the stratospheric representation. Okay, so um, we wanted to look at the surface response following both weak vortex and strong vortex events in these models. And so um, this shows the week three, four temperature um, anomalies following polar vortex extremes. And to do this, we looked at the, ti at the time of initialization, whether the zonal mean zonal winds at 10 millibars and 60 north were either weak, which was considered less than five meters per second or strong, which was greater than 40 meters per second. And first we just made a com composite of what the response was at week three, four. And so the plots on the far left show the error interim response during the S2S time period that we're considering for both weak and strong vortex events. So you can see they are basically um, more or less linear, although there's some differences in some regions between the strong and the weak events. Um, and then we consider that, we compare that to the multi-model mean on the right. And so you can see that in general, it's really capturing that um, NAO sort of pattern um, in the temperatures that we would expect following these events. So, um, there's some differences that we should note. For example, in there's warmer anomalies in error interim compared to the multi-model mean. Um, it doesn't capture the strength of some of those warm anomalies over Greenland or during the strong events over Eurasia. But in general, the, the models are doing a pretty reasonable job. Okay, so then if we look at the skill of the forecasts afterwards, um, to do this, we really needed something to compare against. And so we created control forecasts, which used the same dates as all of our weak and strong vortex events, but were had randomized years. Um, and so then we were able to get a, a set of forecasts where there was presumably nothing going on in the stratosphere to compare to. And so that's what's shown on the left here, the correlation in the root mean square error. And then the middle plots show what happens following these weak vortex events. And so we clearly see some increases in uh, correlation skill following these events, particularly over Eastern Asia, the subtropical Asia region and um, parts of North America. But what we found that was surprising is that notably there's a decrease in correlation skill over Europe relative to the control forecasts. Um, and this is pretty surprising um, and somewhat unfortunate because Obviously, a big source of potential predictability for Europe is um, stratospheric variability. Uh, we think what's going on probably is that because temperature at two meters in particular is very sensitive to exactly where the jet stream moves, um, that these weak events can actually drive increased variability of the jet stream over the North Atlantic. And so it's actually quite a bit harder to predict these events after they occur, uh, to predict the temperature changes after the weak vortex events in that region. Um, and so that's why we're getting a, a decrease in the skill there. The root mean square error mostly decreases everywhere um, for forecasts. So that's a good thing. There's less error in the weak forecast relative to the control in most locations. So this just kind of summarizes the changes in skill for two meter temperature um, following the polar vortex. And here the error bars are showing uh, using a bootstrapping technique 
um, how significant those changes in skill are. So obviously, if we look at the northern hemisphere, there's weak increases in skill, but it's not very significant. But in certain regions, there are um, significant increases in skill, and then notably over Europe, we see less skill following these events. Amy, a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll tie up. Um, one thing we think is that large scale circulation metrics could be more useful than something like two meter temperature. Um, and so this is showing the Northern Annular Mode Index um, in the same sort of way I just showed for two meter temperature at both 100 millibars and 1000 millibars. So this is like the lower stratosphere. So clearly there's a, a nice increase in skill at, at 100 millibars following both strong and weak vortex events. But then at the surface, um, it's noisier, but in general, there's clear increases in skill for almost all the S2S forecast models. And so the idea here is if the, something like the NAM is better predicted um, than inferring the two meter temp through a statistical approach during post-processing may be a better forecast than trying to predict two meter temperature directly. And this is an idea that was also presented in Skype at all 2014. Um, I'm going to skip this part since I'm running out of time, but I wanted to quick touch on some issues that I think are related to uh, stratosphere troposphere coupling in S2S prediction systems. Um, as in many other parts of the climate system, there's systematic biases that prevail, even as the systems raise the model top and increase vertical resolution. And the other, another issue is that the time scale of influence varies a lot from event to event. That's shown in this plot on the left, um, which shows two sudden, different sudden stratospheric warming events. And then I've kind of highlighted where week three, four occurs in that. And obviously during 2018, during week three, four, there was really nice downward coupling. But in 2019, the downward coupling occurred after week three, four. Um, you can see there really wasn't anything going on during week three, four. So how do we best capitalize on a stratospheric windows of opportunity when there's so much variability on, on when that happens after the event? Um, this ties into the fact that the surface response to any given polar vortex event is highly variable. Um, obviously, there's a lot else going on. There's the role of tropospheric influences and large internal variability. And finally, there's still missing processes in the S2S forecast models. And I think Yago will touch more on the QBO, but also ozone feedbacks. There's really um, not ozone chemistry in these models. And I guess the question is, does there need to be? And um, what's the best way to do that? Can this be improved? All right, so I hope I've shown that the stratospheric information and in particularly from the polar vortex is useful um, at a minimum during windows of opportunity for improving predictive skill on S2S timescales, but there are inherent limitations in regions where winter weather can actually be dominated by these events um, for weeks, but the event itself is only predictable at 10 to 15 day lead times. There is potential for probabilistic forecasts of stratospheric polar vortex events at longer leads. I didn't get to touch on that, but um, more work remains to determine how much skill can be gained. And then how best to utilize and convey this information in real time S2S forecasts is still a real question. Um, you know, at this point, talking to people at Climate Prediction Center, for example, they're very aware when these events occur, but how to use that information in real time can be a challenge, I think, um, especially because they don't occur that often. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you. And here's uh, my email and my Twitter handle. If any of you want to follow me on Twitter, I do post a lot about the polar vortex, so um, you can follow me there. Thank you. Thank you. Amy. Thank you. Amy.